25 summers we back. So tell me some of the rules of prison. The written rules, the unwritten rules, you know, things yeah. like that. Major rule was since the double bump era, major rule is not sitting on nobody's bed. You don't sit on the next man's bed. That's a spoken and unspoken rule. Uh, you don't watch another man bathing. Uh, no eye contact, man, when a man is is at partially a half-naked bathing. That's a definitely unspoken rule. Uh, definitely is no stealing. That's another rule that's, that's heavily enforced. Stealing of another person's property. You know, sitting on somebody's bed. Uh, a big rule that's overlooked a lot, but it's still an unspoken rule. You never look at nobody's personal photos. You never look at another man's personal photos of his woman, his wife, or his kids without being invited or being offered to share pictures with all of that. All of these stuffs are violations, man. All of them are punishable, man, by severe repercussions. Okay, what what makes a person powerful in prison? I'm talking about a prisoner, of course. What would make a person powerful or be considered powerful? Rather it be um a gang leader, mm -hmm. he has narcotics, he's tough. What would make a person what are some things that make him powerful? Yeah, all the above. I mean, um it's it's a lot of politics involved with it, but the powerfulness comes with the person that's able to produce something, something that's in demand, whether it's drugs whether it's money, uh, you know, a powerful person is a person that can manipulate people and get a bunch of people to do things that they want them to do by way of manipulating them, man. They might be fond. It could be a clique. It's definitely in the gang association. And powerful people come in all types of shots, sizes, shapes, and forms. You know, if you can produce drugs, if you can, uh, you know, there's some people that can, uh, you know, they can commandeer a situation in the yard just by moving pieces around like a chessboard and they become powerful people, you know, structures. There's a lot of fake power, power that's going on too, you know, and a, a lot of the gang members are dealing with a lot of illusional fake power, you know, whenever you're able to tell two, three hundred people what to do and they all going to listen to you, that's a surge of power. And if you're able to do that, man, you know, you consider to be a powerful, influential person in the penitentiary. Okay, um, with so many, you know, people from different walks of life in prison and stuff, what kind of illnesses and diseases, like, run through the prison or, like, that's common or... Common, like flu. Once one person got it, your whole block might be affected in the next two or three days. The flu is big in there, uh, you know, uh, you know, common colds, the flu... You know, there's brothers that's coming in with, you know, HIV. There's brothers that have tuberculosis. There's brothers that come in. But the basic thing is like a flu, something to spread quick. You know, one person come in, it's a closed confinement. You in a closed confinement. So if one brother come in and he has the flu, sneezing, hacking, cough, sneezing and coughing all over the place, you can rest for sure 80% of the block will be contaminated. By the end of the week, just about everybody in the block is walking around with the symptoms of the flu. Okay, since being home for 11 years now, correct? That's correct. Um, Did you have any or do you have any phobias like you don't like locked doors or white sheets or, I don't know, ivory soap? Or... I, got a, I got a strange phobia, right? It's a strange one. I won't take a shower without shower slippers on. Um, you know, a lot of us, maybe a lot of you might be custom to jumping in your shower, which is normal barefooted and everything like that after so many years of getting in the shower with your feet covered because of the environment it it developed and became a way of life so i got this phobia where i won't get in a shower to this day without shower slippers on my feet including at your house including at my own house yeah <laughs> that's it yeah that well that's the biggest one you know um i don't like uh i have a thing with uh spitting in the sink you know, I have a thing with, with, you know, brushing your teeth, spitting in the sink. That's something I never did. I'll never do. You know, if you brush your teeth over the sink, it's fine. But then you spit your remains and in your, in your contents in your mouth into the toilet. That's something I do. That's another thing that I learned in prison 
It's stuck with me to this day and time. I won't do that. I like closed doors a lot. You know, and sometimes it's hard to fall asleep without a door being closed. You know, so it's a, it's a lot of phobias that I'm still dealing with. That's how about how about lights? Because I know in a lot of prisons, though, don't they keep the lights on overnight, or do they cut them off, or they? At a certain period of time, they'll turn the lights off so that the, the whole cell blocking area will be completely dark. But that's when they ready to do it. And it's at a certain time at night. So you got to be accustomed to being able to go to sleep with a heavy light still shining bright through your cell, whether it's it's time for it to go out or not. Because usually the lights out on the block is like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. So now at home, do you sleep with night lights, lamps on, lights, like how? I, and I find that a lot of times, man, the lights stay on before I, I fall asleep. It's actually turned off after, I, I'm, after I'm going to sleep, you know? Okay. Um, can you explain to us about the correction officers, the CO stealing from inmates or, you know, taking stuff that's mm -hmm. not theirs, rather it's through shakedowns or stuff that's coming in the in the prison, mm -hmm. like you said, the Timberland boots from the factory yeah. in Redding, like uh, a lot of yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff are getting being stolen by way of like package room. Because in a package room, there's not going to be no inmates working there. There's just all police processing a package that you sent me from the outside world. And it has to go through search and it has to be screened and all of that. And the officers are the only ones allowed to do that. But there's a lot of cases, like one case that happened with me. I had bought a pair of Timberland boots. Timberland was in contract with the Timberland uh, manufacturer place, which is in Redding, Pennsylvania. They serviced the whole... New York State Department of Corrections. So if you buy a pair of Timberlands and the an eyelid or something is missing on a boot, you can send it back to them exchange and they'll send you a brand new pair of boots. A lot of times we be having boots that's faulted, there's a stitch missing, there's something like that, and we send it through the package room to go back to the place. When we do send it back to them, we know that they're sending us a new pair of boots back. Yet still, we never, ever rarely see those boots come back again. That's because the officers got hit to there was a process for us to keep, to keep brand new boots on our feet. And so when they figured that out, they figured that since their place send it to them free of charge, why should we give it to them? And they'll keep them and give them to their kids, take them home, wear them themselves. Yeah, a lot of stuff is being stolen through the package room and, you know, and, and shake sh sh shakedowns. Then an officer go in your cell, search your cell for contraband, looking for weapons, drugs, and stuff like that. They'll see an abundance of cigarettes. They'll see an abundance of stamps. They'll see abundance of food. And they'll help themselves to something. No one's the wiser because all they're going to tell you to do is take a claim form, fill out a claim. It'll be investigated. If they find merit of the, of the claim, you will be compensated. If not, oh well, then you just lose the claim. But a lot of stuff are being stolen by way of searching cells, by ways of officers, the package room, by way of officers, uh, commissary, by way of officers. Those are the three major inputs where an inmate can receive something from the outside. And if you don't have no control over it and there's no prisoner there overseeing or watching it and it's all strictly left up to the officers, the chances greatly that a lot of your things will come up missing. So are there any cases that you can remember where a CO actually got in trouble or caught stealing from people or something of that nature? I haven't heard of nobody getting caught, but we know for a fact what our people send. A lot of our people are sending us a list of the things that are being mailed to us. And when we get the stuff, the, the contents, it's short, maybe a pair of sneakers, two or three bags of candy. It's shorts, two, three bars of soap or something, and we know it didn't get lost by way of the mail. It got lost when it came into the hands of the officers to search and screen it for contraband. They call it looking for weapons, knives, drugs, and stuff like that, but they also sitting there helping themselves to your food, your perishable items, you know, so on. You get things like that. They see a nice pair of sneakers. It might be the same size as their kids. Why well, go off to the store and spend... 60 70 bucks on a pair of sneakers when he can easily just throw them in a basket and they took them from an inmate and give them to their kids that's happened often and there's really nothing done about it okay before we end this part can you explain your first day in prison 
Like, what was the intake process when you got there? How many people were on the bus? Do you remember the emotions and the feelings that you were feeling on your way there? You know, your search, your first housing situation, like yeah. things like that. Like, you know, walk us through that. Yeah, you remember the first day. It's, it's the long ride upstate. You're being shackled. That shackle meaning you're having waist chains on, you're having leg irons on, you're having handcuffs on, and you're bounded to yourself. And you're sitting on the bus with about 20 to 30 other prisoners, and you're all destined to go to a place called Intake. And this is the state correctional facility reception area. Downstate was one of the places. Uh, uh, Elmira Reception was another place. You know, uh, Ulster County is another place for medium security prisoners. But then when you get there, man, your whole experience of what you think it was or what you thought it was, it's like magnified a hundred times. It's different, man. You're being bug sprayed. You're being told to get naked. They're stripping you down of everything that you have on. All your stuff is being thrown away, put in a bag like it was contaminated or something. They're telling you to bend over at the waist, spread your buttocks. They're spraying you with bug spray. They call it spraying you for lights and other pesticides and germs. But it's just another way of de dehumanizing you and making you feel less than who you really are. And that takes you into an intake. Intake is a place where they're giving you your state-issue clothes. That's these cheap white underwear, these cheap white socks and T-shirts, and your issue greens. Once you get your issue greens and you put those on, the feeling of that is like, I'm not going home for a while. This is going to be home. So after intake, when you got after intake, when you got to your first prison, what was your first housing situation? The first night, intake is over. Yeah, you sent off to the facility, which was the first one was. Okay, the first one will be Elmira, and it'll be okay. Elmira. So what? Like your first night in Elmira, your first sleeping housing situation. How how was that? What was that? How was that? It's intense, man. You don't really sleep. I didn't sleep at all. You know. Uh, you, 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 you put in a strip cell, you have absolutely nothing in there, you have no personal property. The only thing you have is the prison issue that they give you, which is the pants, the shirt, you know, the socks, the boots, uh, you know, if a coat, if the weather's permitting, the hat, and basically that's it. You're not giving no personal property, no books, no anything to read or anything. You're giving a toothbrush, a small jar, a, a two-ounce jar of toothpaste, and that's about it. And then... You know, from that point on, you know, you're waiting to be classified. And you're waiting to go see your counselor. And she's going to classify you or he's going to classify you and tell you what your media classification is. If it says Max A, nine times out of ten, you're staying right now, Myra. If it says something else lesser than a Max A, you can be put on a transfer in the next week to two weeks to a facility that fits your classification, such as a minimum. If you're medium security then you'll go to a medium prison. If you're a minimum security, you'll go to a minimum security. But like maybe over 60% of the ones going up are usually committed violent crimes or crimes that deal with associated with violence. So your classification will be max eight until the near and indefinite into the near future. 